Many years ago, I began a search for answers. After seeing shadows, capturing hundreds of EVPs, seeing spirits, seeing a UFO, I feel as though that there are more questions than answers. The bunker is a result of years of research into the unknown. I welcome you to join me in my search for answers. Join me in the bunker. Hello, Bunker Dwellers. Tonight, we are turning the tables on the interviewer as he becomes the interviewee. I'm Justin Banforth, your host for the evening, the daytime, or long past the witching hour, depending on when you might be listening. Together, you and me, and maybe even some unseen intelligence out there, will be learning more into the life, the mind, and the force behind the Bunker. We'll be talking one-on-one -on -one with and getting to know its creator and host, Mr. Michael S. Brown. He's not only an author, he's an investigator and one of the great thinkers into the unexplained, as well as a curator of high strangeness with his new show, the one you're listening to right now, The Bunker. Now, perhaps you're just tuning in for the first time, or maybe you've been listening for quite some time. Either way, I hope that this episode sheds some light into his enigmatic new endeavor, as well as its equally important mission as Michael Brown seeks to satisfy his curiosity and indulge his inner intellect, all while taking you, the listener, along for the ride. So without further ado, Michael Brown, hello, and thanks for joining the show, your show. Thanks, Justin. Uh, this, is, this is cool. It's a little awkward to uh, have the, the script flipped on me like this, but, uh, but it's pretty cool. I'm looking forward to it. Great. I'm sure your listeners are as well. You know, you've had a few episodes uh, of The Bunker so far, and you've interviewed a lot of people. You've uh, talked about a lot of cases, um, and it's a very intriguing show. Um, but, you know, let me just ask you first, like, what sets The Bunker apart from all the other paranormal podcasts out there? <clears throat> um, well, I, I think that, and I mean, there may be other hosts that think of it this way but um what i think it seems to be a unique approach uh after having listened to many uh, other podcasts myself um is is i want it to be an organic sort of growing learning process for for me at the same time as you know as well as uh raising awareness of certain cases uh allowing people to tell their stories um also at the same time just speaking to people that know more about certain things than I do and, and actually learning uh, more myself along the way as we go. Um, I, I think podcasting is, is a great way to convey you know, that sort of journey. It's uh, one of the only... Um, well, first of all, it's, like a, it's a completely free uh, market where anyone can start up their own podcast and talk about basically anything. Um, without beholden to, you know, any kind of company or sponsors or whatever, which is awesome. So it gives you the freedom to, to, uh, to put out whatever kind of content you want. Um, but I wanted this podcast in particular to, to give people not only information about different cases and, and how and why we investigate, but also to give them a safe place to actually come and feel comfortable to share their stories. Because some of these, some of these stories, uh, like, um, like the, the, the Carolina terror episode, right. um, there's not a lot of people around that would believe that story mm -hmm. that could, that could sympathize with that gentleman because I mean, he went through hell and was permanently changed as a result of, of those experiences. And that, that happens to, unfortunately, many people around the world. Mm. Uh, it's happening to someone right now, probably somewhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wanted to create a safe space for people to come and, and share their experiences. And that, that's why uh, the bunker, to me, seemed like the most apropos name. Just picturing coming down into this space mm. and being free to share your experience and, and you know, free of ridicule and, and judgment. 
Now, have you had a lot of people who have reached out to you as a result of the show and shared with you some of their experiences? Uh, not a whole lot yet, but uh, people are beginning to come out of the woodwork, and um, and you know we're continuing to work on private cases as well. So I, I think that the combination between the investigations that we're doing and the people that we're helping mm -hmm. and putting this information out via the podcast, right. I think that's going to draw in, it's going to widen the net, and it's going to draw in more and more people. Now, when you mean we, uh, who's we? Uh, it's primarily Beth and myself, mm -hmm. um, but we do actually also work with many other groups uh, out there, paranormal groups. Uh, we, we trained uh, back in 2013, I believe, we, was when we signed up. Uh, went through training with South Jersey Ghost Research. That's right. And that's how you got your start, was training under them. Yes, correct. And that's where I met Beth. She trained at the same time I did. We became investigators at the same time. And uh, so we investigated with that group for a while. And uh, we left that group, joined uh, another group, JPI. We investigated with them for a little bit. And after that, we left that group and, and kind of decided at that point to just sort of become free agents, as it were. Because we had at that point met enough people in enough groups you know, all around the community that uh, that would occasionally need help, you know, just extra hands, you know, for, for either helping with a public event or helping with a private case uh, and so that we could just be free to jump in, free of, you know, politics and free of personalities and everything like that, just be free to just jump in and just help whoever needed help. You know, it was not only people that, you know, needed an investigation yeah. or counseling or were having paranormal issues, but any groups that needed help as well. So it's nice that we had the freedom to kind of bounce around and just help out any people or groups that, that, that need our assistance, which is nice. Yeah, and from time to time, you also share some of those cases with me, uh, especially in the UFO realm, which, um, you know, yeah. what I like about the bunker is that it doesn't just, you know, stick with one particular genre or topic. You know, it goes across the gamut into all of this uh, high strangeness stuff, um, which, as you know, is interconnected and interrelated <laughs> yeah. in so many different ways. Now, um, going back to the SJGR, when you were with them, um, what was your primary responsibility and duties with that group? Well, we were in training for pretty close to, it was just shy of an entire year was, was the actual training before we took our exam and everything at the end. And we're, we're trained with uh, you know, covering every aspect of the investigation process, to, for, you know, beginning with, you know, um, psychic protection and learning about um, preternatural cases and um, and uh, you know negative cases and you know how how bad it can get, and hearing a lot of examples of you know what we could be stepping into, and then we would uh, you know be trained on how to use the extensive questionnaire that we would send out to a potential client that they would fill out send back to us, we review it, go through it, look for any sort of flags that would pop up, anything that looks strange, things that don't add up, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then from that step would be next to doing a walkthrough and an interview with the client in their home, um, taking measurements, yeah, you know, through using all the equipment, do's and don'ts, when to use equipment, when not to, mm -hmm. false positives, um, and then the writing of the reports, time stamping your evidence, um, so a really thorough investigative process. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, and then then there's a whole system on how to review the evidence, and you know, put that together with a formal report that would be turned in with all your evidence, and how to tag the evidence to, so that you know exactly, you know, like you would you'd be able to know by the name of the file what time that was captured and where, and the, what you know, so the basic context of that of that file was, so that when you're just looking at it, you would know, oh, okay, yeah, that was from the third floor at nine fifty. You know, <clears throat> so it was very, very extensive logging process and, and report process, uh, and then all those reports would be would be you know taken in by the team leader and reviewed and put together into one master report, which would be turned into the client and along with any evidence and stuff. And then you know you sit back down with the client at the end, go through the evidence, and then talk them through you know the recommendations on how they would handle that haunting or whatever they were whatever activity they had moving forward. So um, with that group. I know that they focused on a lot of very intense negative cases. Um, they actually had a special uh, unit, right, to handle those types of cases? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they had an mm -hmm. SRT uh, team, which was uh, made up of, you know, more seasoned investigators that were, 
you know, they, they could sort of prove that they could handle those more intense cases. And uh, it would primarily be uh, identified in the the primary initial contact from the client along with the uh, the questionnaire. And that's when the flags would jump out. And based on the source of activity they were reporting, and it, like a certain flag would be uh, attached to that case. And it would be, you know, like a, I think it was green for like a standard, you know, just basic haunting. You know, and then it was like a yellow for a possible negative haunting. And then it was like red for, mm. you know, definitely negative, super serious case. And based on those ratings, yeah. you know, that would determine who, you know, and when and how quickly you get out there and, and uh, take care of it. Oh, what were some of those, like, red flags? Um, red flags would be what you would categorize as uh, demonic. Something that is uh, uh, usually harming the client in some way. They're getting scratched, pushed, mm. you know, objects thrown at them, uh, you know. Uh, you know, having intense um, personal, like they they were, they were getting really negatively affected emotionally by mm-hmm. what was going on, um, and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean that was, if something was a red flag, it was usually at least potentially something demonic. We're on that level. Okay, and like, what types of signs would like check mark that particular box? Some of the things I remember specifically that raise flags would be um, like, for example, some of the questions would be like, how many rooms are in the house? And how many people are living there? Um, and their names and stuff like that. And I remember some of the flags would be like the, the, the number of rooms mm-hmm. and the people living there wouldn't add up. And so that would be kind of like a hmm. That's that that doesn't seem right. That doesn't fit. So we'll need to we'll need to look into that hmm. because there are some some cases where people would actually have entities in their home and would have them there so long that they would think of them as a person living there. No kidding. Yeah, and uh, and so little things like that would would jump out at you in that questionnaire. Certain questions they would they would ask, or if you know if they said you know. Like one of the questions is, uh, you know, do you have interest in the occult or have you ever practiced any kind of witchcraft or anything like that? And if there's a yes to any of those questions, that's an, usually an automatic flag right there because those cases usually bring a more intense, not necessarily demonic mm-hmm. haunting, but usually a more intense activity going on there as a result. Interesting. Yeah. Um, now, you also work in the psychic realm in, to a certain extent. And I think you explained it to me one time. You don't consider yourself a psychic medium so much as that would be Beth's realm, but yeah. you would consider yourself sensitive, right? Yes. Yeah. And I, the way I make the distinction is, and it's an interesting thing that I pointed out in a previous episode as well, is uh, is that I when I started out and and I was looking into joining a group because I had moved into a home that had like pretty, I want to say severe, but it was pretty intense. Uh, activity going on and it was almost a daily basis hmm. and so after that that's when I, I joined the group and I was looking online for different groups in the area and I found SJGR and I I honestly it's funny I almost didn't want to join the group because I saw that they used psychics mediums and they used the scientific method in the equipment and I was like hmm. oh they use psychics come on hmm. <laughs> because at that point I had never really met anyone that I thought had legitimate abilities or that demonstrated anything legitimate to me. So I just thought it was hokey. I yeah. didn't think there was anything to it. And so, um, so then I, you know, I go through training and I start investigating. And then over time, as I'm going through places with, you know, with psychics and mediums, you know, particularly Beth, I would begin to feel weird in certain areas. I would feel changes in the environment. I would feel dizzy all of a sudden hmm. in a certain spot. And, um, and actually, there was there was a there was a point in uh, in our episode, I believe, where we we're talking about the Hoskins case okay. in Burlington. There was one particular spot in uh, in the dining room, I believe, where if once I stepped into that spot, I felt like I was in the middle of like the only way I could describe it is if like you, you if you're at like a friend's pool mm-hmm. and everybody gets together, it's like you know the old school round above ground pools, and everybody. 
goes around the outside and starts like all going in one direction. Right. And you feel that current going around. Oh, yeah, sure. It felt like that, but sort of like from my shoulder's neck up. Hmm. I felt this weird just momentum like pulling me and I got really off balance and dizzy. Hmm. But when I just took three or four steps in any direction, the feeling went away immediately. And I thought, that's that's really weird. So I made note of it and then I asked Beth this to just you know, I didn't say what or why, and I just said, you know, step in the spot over here. And she walked over. She's like, wow, I feel really dizzy. So she felt it. And then the other gentleman that was investigating with us, she stepped out and he stepped in. He felt it too. And and by this point I'm five feet away and I'm standing there. I feel fine. The the the, the sensation's gone. He steps out, I step into that spot, comes right back. So there was something going on in that spot that I could sense and that we could sense. And over time, I discovered, like, while I was investigating, like, I was having these odd sensations. And then, you know, Beth would be there and she would say, well, yeah, I feel that too. There's something, something's going on here, you know. And she would add insight as the, and, and, and verification too that, yeah, yeah, there's something weird. It doesn't feel right here. Or, or, or a, a spirit just walked through or whatever. So, like, I never had the ability. I mean, I'm maybe, who knows, I'll get to that point at some, at some point in the future, but I'm not gifted enough to see a spirit walk in, describe what they look like, communicate directly, you know, the way Beth does. But I, but I do feel changes in the environment that, that I can't explain, that, that, are, that sometimes I can verify with equipment, which is interesting. Do you think that like anyone has a certain level of sensitivity or can have intuitive or psychic abilities? The way we were trained is that everyone is sensitive to a certain degree. Yeah, and the way it was described to us is that, um, you know, this, you think of the psychic ability like an antenna. And, you know, certain people have just better equipment, if you want to think of it that way, a better receiver or a better antenna. And so it can pick up on more things. And whereas other people, you know, it's not as good. And so they pick up less. Um, but it was also described to us, and we were encouraged to, to take, you know, psychic development courses because they, the, you know, they told us that, uh, and this is what, uh, Beth actually at this point now teaches other people is uh, is that the psychic antenna it's like a muscle and the more that you you bring focus to it and attention to it and the more you exercise it and practice it the stronger it can get so you do seem I mean that's I've seen it in practice and I've seen mm-hmm. people develop abilities and get more and more sensitive and I've seen myself get more and more sensitive over the years too so it does seem to, to hold true that that the more you use it the more it, the stronger it gets on that note, then, um, do you think that when people are just reading about this topic or watching TV shows on this topic, that they can somehow maybe inadvertently bring out more of an awareness that, uh, to this phenomenon? Or Because um, I get that a lot, right? People always say, like, oh, I don't want to, I don't know, for example, get involved with the UFO subject because I feel like I'm going to get abducted. <laughs> I'm like, well, I don't think it works that way, but... But maybe on some levels it does. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Like, maybe not with alien abduction, but I, I think I think that there is a correlation between what activity is going on and and the person themselves that are witnessing it. I think that there is there is some kind of connection there that um, that. I think that hopefully in the future soon that we'll 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 be able to nail down and get a more definitive answer on. Hmm. But one thing we do uh, come across, and it's been, and it, we've been coming across it more and more seemingly uh, over the past several months, is that people that are frightened and that believe they have negative things going on in their home also are having a difficult time in their life, just emotionally or socially, um, and. It's there seems to be a direct correlation with the person's state of mind and what type of activity manifests or how it manifests and how it shows itself. Hmm. Because we we've had a lot of cases lately where people contact us terrified, and then once you interview them and you start going through their life and what's going on, they have you know there's 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 trouble in their marriage. They're they have they're, they're, the job is super stressful and they can't take it and they want to fuck it. They want to quit and get get another job. Hmm. All this uncertainty or just the heightened emotional you know, sort of environment. And right. that seems to feed into the activity. Now, whether that whether that changes the activity 
and and makes it negative or makes it more intense or or it, the person's emotional state changes the way they perceive it. I'm not really sure, or maybe a combination of the two. But there, there's definitely a, a a connection between the client's like emotional state and and what kind of activity is going on. So I remember reading in um, Ralph Sarchi's book. Um, yeah, he was uh, detailing how when he was studying under Ed and Lorraine Warren. Uh, they always told him uh, before he went into a case to always be in a state of grace. Um, in other words, get your mind right, right, and your um, your thoughts. Um, yeah. When you're going into a case like that, like a negative case, um, are you worried about things attaching themselves to you or, or following you back? Maybe it, because you're not in that right right mindset, or you're going in it with different intentions, or that's definitely a concern. Um, I the way we were trained, and, and we pretty much follow this principle to this day, is um, if if there is a case that's scheduled, and, and you're a team member, and you're scheduled to to investigate that case that night, and you happen to just have something going on in your life, or you're sick, mm. uh, you were just injured. Uh, you're you're in a bad place emotionally, something like that. If you're not at your if you're not on top of your game for that night for that investigation, then you're advised to stay home and let someone else step in and, and handle that. Because uh, just, you know, and it was based on the belief that yeah, if if you if you're not on top of your game, if you're emotionally not in the right place, mm -hmm. that you could essentially bring negativity into that case or more negativity into that case and therefore make it worse or cause something to attach to you so we we go to pretty extensive lengths if we're going into a case especially if we think it's intense or negative in any way that we really make sure that we are 100 percent on top of our game hmm. and we have you know every piece of equipment and cleansing and blessing materials that we can that, that we can get that we have it on hand just in case you yeah, know so something something goes uh, south on us yeah has that ever happened to you at any point, or had you seen it occur? Um, that hasn't happened to us, but but I have seen uh, an investigator just literally drop and hit the floor like a ton of bricks um, <laughs> because they were just affected by whatever the energy was, and that's another one of those uh, occasions where. I felt weird. Like I definitely yeah. felt like off balance and kind of on edge, and I felt like the, whoops, and I and I felt that weird sort of off balance feeling in my head. And I was looking around like, what the heck, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was just looking around to see if anyone else felt that. And then this investigator just like literally just drops and hits the floor. So oh. and we had to uh, actually pick her up. A couple people picked her up and just brought her outside. You know, just set her down next to a tree mm -hmm. and uh, give her some fresh air and just let her, you know, breathe and ground. And uh, wow. after, after a little while, she was fine, but. Huh. Yeah. That's bizarre. That's um, pretty crazy. Now, you've studied religion. Um, in what particular uh, aspect of religion intrigued you the most about, about all of them? Um, I grew up uh, in the Presbyterian Church. Mm -hmm. And I was... Um, like a youth group leader and stuff like that. So I was involved when I was younger in uh, Christianity. I got to a certain point where it, uh, I don't know, it just, it just, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't, uh, it just, it just kind of stopped working for me. Mm. So I just started searching. Um, and uh, a friend of mine was going to college for philosophy. And so it was, Taking a lot of courses on like different philosophies, Zen Buddhism, and you know, Eastern religions, Western religions, and philosophers and the like. And so I was fortunate to like get some of those books when he was done with them. So <laughs> so I would take them and and read through them. And uh, and so I started getting exposed to different different religions, and I and I I felt a, a strong connection to Eastern religions. So I started studying those. And so. When I went to school, 
I started just basically studying like any and every religion I could possibly, you know, get my hands on. And well, I came across uh, the works of Joseph Campbell in college and started, uh, started following him and I started reading everything that he put out. Um, and he was essentially a, a comparative mythologist, which, which means he, he basically did on a, on a grand scale what I was doing. And that was just studying all these different mythologies and religions from all the different cultures since the beginning of time, studying all of them, taking notes and had file cabinets filled with his notes of all these different religions he studied. And, uh, and what he did is he drew a thread through all of these different religions and mythologies, and he found all these consistencies throughout all of them, as if they were all at some level all kind of saying the same thing. Hmm. And uh, once I came across his works, and uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces in particular, and The Power of Myth, um, that's really where all it, everything clicked and it all made sense. In other words, that's where I realized that all the world's religions are basically on a on a deep level are all saying the same thing and all these things they're talking about are all universal truths that are just human it's just part of the human experience and the human journey that are just described in different ways based on the culture so do you think that you know tying it back to the paranormal do you think we could be dealing with the same thing uh, that's existed since all throughout human history it's just maybe we call it something else now I think so I think so for sure um because if you think about, you know, let's just say, for example, um, a, a giant bright white orb, for example, just manifests in the middle of town and it descends into the middle of the town and everybody sees it and they all run out. Uh, if, if, if it takes place in a, in a Christian context, they're most likely going to describe that as an angel came down or a beautiful spirit or the blessed mother or whatever. Uh, you know, if it's a if it's a Buddhist context, you know they will say it is it's an ascended master that's come down to, you know, come back to our, our realm to to give teachings or whatever. You know, so I think I think that we're surrounded by by energy and by vib- vibration and and all manners and 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 spectrums of of good and evil. And it's all just universal. And I think that we're all just based on our own experience. We're just describing it in the best way we can. And that's based on our experience and our knowledge and what we've learned and read about and stuff like that. And I think yeah. that, you know, that we, it is all really the same thing. Yeah, I've always wondered if, you know, maybe what we're dealing with has no definitive shape form. It's just taking on something so that we can identify it, you know, so that we can just have some sort of visual a frame of reference that we can explain to others, you know. But it could be that maybe this thing has no shape or form or presence. Maybe it just is. I mean, it, I mean, we can we can speculate all day. But yeah, um, true. Just speaking of you know that glowing orb that you just described a few moments ago, um, UFOs. How did you get involved with UFO Enigma? UFOs. I've been interested in UFOs ever since I was ever since I can remember. Um, oh, I'm sorry, we can't call it UFO anymore. UAP, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Whatever, whatever it's called. It probably has another name by now. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, when when I was a little kid, I mean, some of my first memories are you know growing up watching you know In Search of with Leonard Nimoy, and uh, I was uh, yeah I was fortunate to actually have growing up watching that show and watching the show with my father who was actually stationed at white sands new mexico uh, back in the 1950s so shortly after the roswell incidents took place uh he was transferred there so he was transferred to white sands to white sands yeah and uh he was in the army as and he worked as a mechanic so he uh he had a couple interesting stories about going out there and, uh, you know, I were watching the show in search of, and, and they mentioned Roswell on one of the episodes, I believe. And he actually, you know, 
had some insight in, into into what happened because he was you know he arrived in that same area just a few years after that took place and uh he had a couple stories about people that he spoke to that were present around that area when when the roswell incident happened oh and they goodness. didn't you know not directly they didn't see any craft or anything like that yeah. but they did see you know the mps swoop in you know blanket the area seal off you know uh the uh the the, uh, the whole ranch uh, and we're going through the town and we're questioning people like crazy. And oh. there was this heightened, you know, military presence in the whole entire area for, for like weeks after that, oh after goodness. it took place. And they, and the people that were present for that and saw it, yeah. you know, unfolding, um, were there and he got to actually speak to them. So it was kind of cool that, that I could get that perspective on somebody that, you know, spoke to some of these people that were there. Wow. Um, That's and so, incredible. you know, that, that really just spiked my interest so much that, uh, that I was always interested in UFOs and, and I never thought getting into the paranormal and investigating hauntings. It, I never thought that it would bring me back to UFOs, but it's now it's come full circle. And, you know, it seems like more and more is happening where we will get called in to assist someone with a haunting. And lo and behold, after speaking to them a little bit, then they, they bring up, they saw a UFO. It was over their house or over their backyard hmm. or they had a dream. They were, taken or their child was taken or you know and it, it's just these stories just seem to come out more and more when we hear it. go you know you start out investigating what you think is going to be haunting and lo and behold you're hearing stories about aliens it's, it's bizarre um have you ever seen a ufo uh once tell me once. about it <laughs> yeah two two years ago i was uh leaving work i worked in south brunswick New Jersey at the time, and I was leaving there, and I was headed to yoga teacher training, which was taking place in Medford, New Jersey, further south. And I was driving through Medford along a couple of uh, farm roads, and it was a, like a partly cloudy, partly sunny day. And I was driving my car. It was a two-lane road, and there was one car ahead of me, and we're approaching an intersection. And there was there's one car on you know the opposite side of the intersection headed towards us, and we had a green light, but it was it was a stale green. So I was keeping my eye on it because I knew it was about to change. And we're you know slowing down, slowing down because I'm going to be making a left at that light. So mm. I'm slowing down anyway. And for some reason, and I still I didn't realize the oddity of it until later when I thought back. But for some reason, all of a sudden, I just happened to. Instead of looking where I'm going, I all of a sudden just turn my head and, and cock my head to the side and look out the passenger or the driver's side window rather, out and up. And I don't, nothing caught my eye. I didn't see a flash of light. I, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't, it, not, you know, a bird didn't fly by. There's no logical reason why I would have just all of a sudden just looked out and up straight up into the sky. And did you feel compelled? At I just kind of did it without thinking about it. So I don't know why I did. So I just cock my head and I look up, and I look directly at what you would say is a a classic example of a flying saucer. I mean, it was a round, you know, almost flat disc. Uh, there was I, there was a slight um, like dome on the top. The bottom looked pretty much just flat and plain. And it was like silver in color, like a dull silver. And it was just hovering there. And I, I couldn't believe my eyes. I, I just, I'm like, oh my God, there's a fine freaking saucer. And it's just daytime. And it was in the daytime, yeah. Wow. Um, so, so then I, I come back to my senses and I snap back and I look. The other car goes through the intersection, passes me. Car in front of me goes straight. So, okay, so I, I'm pulling out my cell phone now. I'm like, I'm going to make this left turn. As soon as I make this left, I'm going to jump out of the car mm. and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get a picture of this thing. So I make the left. I'm like you know, ripping my seatbelt off as I'm like pulling off to the side of the road mm. as I'm getting my, you know, my cell phone out at the same time. Open up my door. And at this point now, there's a cloud that had passed in front of the spot where I had seen the, the UFO. Oh. So I thought, okay, all right, so let me just stand by here for a second. As soon as this cloud passes, I'm going to snap the picture. So I got my phone out, and I zoomed in, and I'm like, all ready. And as the cloud moved away, it was gone. Huh. And 
I, I was running late, but I didn't really care at this point. I was, I, I stuck around and I was like looking around, like, you know, what oh, did it shoot over here or there? Right. I did never see it again. And I don't, I don't know what, what direction it went in or, or what, but I mean, it was just there one second and 10 seconds later it was gone. And how far, uh, how close were you to this, to this object? <sighs> That's difficult to tell because it was in the sky, but the cloud cover, I'm, it, saying was about 1,000 to 1,500 feet, and it was slightly above that, so somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 feet. Uh, lower than normal aircraft um, or higher? Uh, it was probably, for that area, mm -hmm. a, a little bit less. I mean, there is a, there is a small airport near there, okay. um, but it, it, they, I mean, they're flying all obvious terrestrial aircraft and helicopters yeah. and Cessnas and stuff like that they you obviously recognize but I mean this thing was just levitating was just floating there hmm. and you know I jumped out of the car I mean I didn't hear any jet wash well, I didn't hear I didn't hear any aircraft I didn't hear anything now when it was floating there was it was it moving at all or was it rotating or was it just literally like a picture and just like frozen in time? It, it was because of the texture and the color. It's difficult to tell if it was spinning, hmm. um, but I didn't see any windows or any features on it that would that would that would make rotation obvious. If you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, so it could have been rotating. I'm not really sure, but it's the, as far as I can see, the way it looked to me in that couple seconds I looked at it, it looked like it was just sitting there, motionless, just just hovering there. Wow. You know, a lot of times you hear in some of these cases, people, um, they feel like this compulsion to just go outside. They don't know why. And then something just tells them to just, you know, look up. But yeah. in this case, you didn't have that. You just almost instinctively cocked your head and looked up. Yeah. Do you ever think that this phenomenon uh, has more control over us than we like? Than we care to admit. I think so. I think some of it, for sure, seems to. Um, I, I think that. Uh, well, when when we were actually doing research for our first episode about the Stonehenge incidents. Oh right, right. And we traveled up to North Bergen mm -hmm. to just. Uh, go just drive around the area and just see it firsthand uh, with with the case report in my hand and just get a better sense of where this stuff took place and where the you know eyewitnesses were and you know how close was this craft supposedly landing you know in reference to the to the apartment building etc cetera, etc cetera. and while we were there you know I described this this extremely odd person that, that walked up to us and just started sniffing me and <laughs> I mean every person I tell the story to mm -hmm. the reaction is the same thing you're like you just stood there you didn't say anything mm. and I, 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 I still to this day I can't explain why I couldn't say anything I literally could not say anything I couldn't get up say mm. what the hell's wrong with you uh, or laugh or because it was comical but I just couldn't say or do anything and and Beth was sitting next to me, and I mean, I couldn't even look at her. She didn't look at me. We were just, per, just transfixed on this weird person, mm -hmm. <laughs> just staring at him as he was sniffing me. And we just sat there, without saying or doing anything, without moving. And, and then he he did his thing. He sniffed me for a good twenty seconds or so, and then he walked away. And then we just both, our eyes just followed him, and just as he walked away, and he turned around the corner of a bush, and. And it was like we snapped out of it at that point. Like what? And then I finally looked at her and I was like, what the heck was that? And then we finally started communicating back and forth with it. And just, you know, we laughed. And we're like, what the heck was wrong with that guy? But for whatever reason, it was we were just frozen there. And I couldn't say or do anything. And I, that's, not my, that's not my normal reaction to something, that, something like that. Mm -hmm. My first reaction would normally be like, bro, what the hell's your problem? What are you doing? Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, or I, laugh or something, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, it's you know, it, it's one of these aspects of paranormal research that I think is very um, 
underreported, mm. and uh, or people just you know don't don't focus on it because it just seems in, insignificant. But really, yeah. uh, it could be very telling about how the phenomenon operates. Um, there's a lot of this this manipulation factor. Yeah, and uh, I think investigators um, should do more research into this. And they might be surprised and disturbed by what they might find. Um, yeah, I agree with that because, yeah, and you know, and hear all the cases of the of the men in black, right? And how they're just these people have, just have the same kind of effect. They're transfixed. They can't do anything. They can't say anything. They're they're, they're yeah. feeling their energy drained. These things just appear, disappear, and they yeah, they're they're either terrified of them or they're or just completely in awe and they can't move or. And it feels like the same kind of thing. So I think there is what exactly that phenomena is. I don't know. It's not guys in suits. I don't think, but you know, whatever that phenomena is, like some of it, hundred percent, has influence over us. Yeah, it's a uh, it's very disturbing. And another disturbing aspect of this research is uh, alien abductions. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And have you have you uh, talked with any alien abductees? Or contactees, as they're also referred to. We, yeah, we actually, we had another case, again, that, that started out as uh, assistance with a haunting uh, that turned into, you know, all these other stories of beings coming and uh, taking this person's child hmm. on, on more than one occasion. This was like a regular thing. It was happening regularly. And this person was so disturbed by the 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 abduction activity that she asked them to make her forget like she didn't she didn't want to witness it anymore she didn't want to remember it anymore so oh. she asked them literally i don't want to just make me forget the entities the entities hmm. which she wasn't afraid of but she was disturbed by the fact that you know they were coming, taking her child, and they, they told her that he was special and they needed him, and right. and that, that she should not fight back because then something bad would happen. So, so she said, you know, basically agreed, okay, but I I don't want to remember this anymore. Um, wow. And then shortly thereafter, she began experiencing all this missing time. Hmm. Um. And some of the experiences she was describing were coming across in a semi dream state. Or some of them were dreams, mm -hmm. and so I was kind of on the fence. Like, I, how much of this is legitimate activity, how, or how much of this is is you know lucid dreaming that she's mm -hmm. just sort of spun out of control. I don't know because that does happen too. But um, but then this person's mother also reported that she saw this craft mm -hmm. that was seen, and you know it's it's the the the. the the descriptor that she used to describe the, the craft that really jumped out at me was the sound it made. This low humming, hmm. low droning humming sound, which I, I, I'm sure you've heard that a dozen times. Yeah, you know, a lot of people think UFOs are completely silent, but no, there's reports that they do make um, stuff like that, you know, low hums or frequencies yeah, um, or just other odd sounds. Yep. Um, it's like this phenomenon it, it's like it operates within certain like uh, guidelines or, or a certain framework but mm -hmm. then it that doesn't mean that that's what it has to be every single time you know it can <laughs> completely change you know this you know especially with paranormal research you know yeah it, it seems to almost play by the rules for a while to sort of let you think you figured it out and then, yeah. and then it just blows the whole script up in your face and <laughs> just goes and <laughs> makes a left turn and then and you're left scratching your head again. It's frustrating and also exciting. <laughs> it is. Uh, how did that case turn out? Well, there was there was some intense stuff going on there. That and again, that was another case where this person had a lot of emotional stuff to work through. Mm. Uh, which uh, which she did. Last we heard, she was doing much better. We did a, a whole cleansing and a blessing, and and we found some we found some odd things on the property that we had to dispose of. Um, oh, like what? Um, uh, like they, weird relics and there were some odd relics mm. and uh i don't want to give any more detail than that okay um so could there be like some sort of energy attached to certain objects yeah uh, yeah i think so okay i think so if, if if someone pours enough intent 
or malice into something mm -hmm. or enough positive energy into something. Yeah, I, I feel it, it can leave a residue. Uh, for these particular items, and there were several of us there, we were working with another team on, on this one. And uh, in, in this particular case, like we all just saw these things and we're like, I mean, we, she was just describing them to us and we were like, what? Hmm. So, so when she she showed us the one, and another one was her husband kind of thought he disposed of it, he buried it. Hmm. Uh, so we ended up having to go back into the yard and dig it up. Um, but Beth was able to locate pretty much exactly where it was on the ground. Hmm. And then we just dug up and, you know, luckily found it. Um, took it, you know, just uh, about a mile down the street. There was a nice little bridge with a nice strong running stream. And we just kind of, <laughs> you know, gave it love and light and just tossed it in the water. <laughs> love and light into the water. And just got rid of it. But uh, So floated on to the next person. Well, hopefully, it, you know, it uh, neutralized whatever was in there. But, but and, and after all that stuff was done, uh, yeah. She was doing much much better after that. So, and we haven't heard anything from her since. Huh. So, so if someone has an object that they think is, dare I say, cursed or um, is a strange relic that they'd rather not have, how are they supposed to get rid of it? Like, I mean, what's what's proper protocol or you know, guidelines, so to speak? Because you always hear about things, right? Like you have to, oh, you have to drown it, or no, no, you have to set fire to it. No, no you have to bury it. No, it's <laughs> throw in the ocean. You know, what, what do you do? Yeah, I, I think there's a there's a complex uh, equation there, and it, and it to me it has to do with what 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 the item is, what its purpose was, which may or may not be clear, um, what it means to the client, how they acquired it, um, and what if anything have they done with that item. Um, you know, you, you kind of have to weed through all these details and, and, uh, you know, if, if you can find, you know, if it, if it's a, if it's a religious item and you can find someone in your local church or synagogue or whatever that that's willing to take that and either bless it or cleanse it or, or whatever, you know, you can do that. Um, we have had many uh, cases at t with teams that we've worked with that have agreed to remove the item from the premises and uh, and bring it to John Zaffis, who is um, well versed in items that are you know cursed or just uh, negative in some way, and taking those and sealing them up, okay, or disposing of them, um, you know whatever the case may be. So he's the real deal. He, he's the real deal. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, how do you find people for for your show? Do they reach out to you? Do you reach out to them? How do, how does that work? Uh, so far, it's been a combination of people reaching out to me, uh, or just people I have connected with, you know, through either Twitter, uh, Facebook, or whatever. And your Twitter handle is? And my Twitter handle is uh, at in the bunker cast. In the bunker cast. Yes. And is Twitter the best way to reach you, or do you have another preferred method of contact? Twitter is good. I, I prefer either Twitter or uh, or my email, which is mail to the bunker at gmail dot com. Mail to t o the bunker at gmail dot com. Correct. And um, how is I mean how's the reaction been so far? I mean, you mentioned that. Your show is now broadcast in uh, what, 10 different countries, or yeah. has reached 10 different countries <laughs> yeah. at this point. Yeah, that's crazy. It's pretty exciting. It, it's really exciting. Yeah, it's cool. And uh, there, you know, there's there's been a couple of other podcasts that um, that uh, that I've connected with that you know that uh, are listening to the show, and I'm listening to, to their episodes now. Um, and uh, there's um, it's called Believe. Hmm. Paranormal Radio, which is uh, out of uh, um, Australia, which is a really cool program. It's a good host. Um, and uh, UFO Chronicles out of the UK are pretty cool. Those are, those are two I enjoy and I listen to regularly. Um, but yeah, it's really cool to see to see the the listeners come, you know, checking in from like all all over the globe. It's 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 really cool. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Um, and just to, you know, 
get your show out there and uh, reaching other people. I'm sure as a result, you're going to get more stories and more experiences um, from other people. Um, any plans to take the, the bunker into other formats or mediums in the future? Or are you just going to stick with uh, podcasting? It's a great question. It's something I've kind of like kind of in the back of my mind. Uh, it's it's going to remain a podcast for a while. I mean, I'd like to do a couple of seasons, three, four seasons, maybe. Uh, but eventually, I was thinking of doing something maybe on YouTube, where you know we could uh, possibly maybe live stream some investigations and some cases and stuff, mm. pop some you know some evidence up there. Uh, and connect that to the podcast or the cases that we're working on and talking about on the podcast uh, so that, you know, so that people can get like a visual sort of reference and, and, uh, and see what we're doing as well as hearing about it. I think that'll be pretty cool, but something we'll do, you know, down the road. Hmm. What does, what does the bunker look like a couple years from now? Apart from that, where do you see it or, or rather it's mission? Well, the mission's going to be going to be the same as it's been, and that is to to just continue to hunt down cases and witnesses, share their stories, share case files, uh, share things I'm interested in, uh, things that that uh, that I'm investigating, things that uh, you know that that I find compelling that others are investigating. And you know, at the same time, giving people that platform to share their experiences, and and uh, you know, and maybe also, you know, either helping these people directly or passing them along to someone that can help them. Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, ideally, you want if you have if you have activity in your home or or, or 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 you have abilities you think are out of control, or you're dealing with things, and you're far away from us here mm -hmm. in New Jersey, it's it would be difficult to personally help that person face to face but you know we can always put them in touch with others that are that are closer to them in their area that could that could help them and i think that'll be great you know to to get that networking out there mm -hmm. just 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 get the help to the people that need it because because people having paranormal issues it's it, you, you can't call the police or the fire department or social mm -hmm. workers or you know a psychiatrist because they're not going to be able to help you with that stuff mm -hmm. you know uh what do you hope or desire to hear more about from your audience is there any particular topics that you really want to like get into? I mean, I, I love a good old fashioned haunting, um, but I, I, I feel like the show is going to get deeper in the weeds with, with UFOs and with just general high strangeness that doesn't necessarily fit into any sort of category. I think that's where I think I just feel that's where it's going. Mm -hmm. I can just kind of sense that's that's where we're headed. Um, it's almost like it's almost like the phenomena knows. <laughs> yeah. It's becoming conscious of of, of uh, my prying eye, and it's gonna. <laughs> well, it's always a couple of steps ahead. So <laughs> for sure, it, it, it knows before even you know. And that's so one true. Of the, that's one of the disturbing aspects about it. But um, so true. Uh, how can your fans help spread the word about the bunker? Well. I uh, was just looking at this the other day. I noticed that a, a lot of our listeners are listening to us on Apple Podcasts. Um, the best way to help us out on there and help spread the word is to is to put a rating in there. If you put a if you put a rating in there and some comments uh, about the show, that's just going to help uh, raise that podcast in the in standings, as it were, and help other people find it. Mm. Um, and just by word of mouth, um, you can if you follow me on Twitter. I will usually post a link to the latest episode as it goes up. So, mm -hmm. you know, give it a listen. You know, if you, if you enjoy it, give it a share. If, if there's anybody that you know that's having, you know, hauntings or unpleasant activity or, or UFO activity or something like that that, uh, that they're having trouble with, you know, pass their information along and we'll hear them out. We'll keep anything and everything that you share with us confidential unless, unless you want to come on the show and talk about it, you know. Mm. So, you know, so we always keep 100% anonymity uh, in, in anything we ever do, uh, unless the client's comfortable with us either, you know, coming on the episode and talking with us about it or 
at least having us share the details of it. You know, most people are okay with sharing EVPs, for example. Okay. So we'll, you know, we'll share those and explain. EVP, electronic voice phenomenon? Correct. The weird yeah. audio clips that sound a little spooky. <laughs> yeah. For those of you out there who don't know what that is. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the most common piece of evidence that we capture when we investigate. And, uh, and that seems to be the, the case with most investigators. Um, and again, what exactly that is, I, you know, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, I, I can, you know, I can't really explain how a, a group, or, you know, a room full of investigators can have six recorders in a room. Hmm. One investigator hears a voice. Three recorders pick it up. Three don't. The rest of the investigators didn't hear anything. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that happens in every combination that you can imagine. Mm-hmm. So, you know, how that how that happens, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's certainly a bizarre phenomenon, and um, I don't think any one of us is ever going to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. It's just one of those things, is it may not be meant to be figured out, you know. It might not. Um, it's, it's fortunate that it's so fun chasing it, though, because otherwise everyone would be utterly frustrated by this point and have given up by now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's just... It's fun to catch evidence, you know, and it's great, and it's it's a really satisfying experience to help somebody hmm. and to get to the end of a case. Whether you catch the evidence or not is, is secondary, but to to leave that person's home and they're now more comfortable in their home and they they feel they feel empowered to to take their house back, mm-hmm. you know, like I'm no longer afraid to go in my basement or in the, this part of the house, you know, mm-hmm. um, that that's probably the most satisfying part of it. But you know, catching evidence is great too. Well, there you have it, folks. Straight from Michael Brown, the host of The Bunker himself. If you want to get in touch with him, again, if you're on Twitter, reach out to his uh, his Twitter handle, which is in the bunker cast. That's in the bunker cast, or you can email him uh, mail to the bunker at gmail dot com. That's mail t o the bunker at gmail dot com. You can follow me, uh, uh, Justin Bamforth, at normalparanormal.org. Uh, from there, you can find all my social media pages and links to my book, The Spectrum. Um, I'm always collaborating with Michael on all sorts of different things. Uh, do you prefer Michael or Mike, by the way? Either either one's fine. Either one? Yeah. Okay, we'll just call you Mr. Brown. <laughs> um, you know, you, you got a good perspective, and that's why I, I really believe in this show, and I think it can it has legs. It can go somewhere. Um, because again, you're not just focusing on one aspect of high strangeness, you're focusing on all aspects of high strangeness. Absolutely. Which, which as you know, um, is something I've been very interested and involved with. Um, so it's great. I can't wait to see where the bunker goes from here. And, um, if you're listening to this particular episode, please, please, please share your experiences with Michael, Mike, Mr. Brown, whatever you refer to him as. Um, he's waiting there. So waiting to hear your cases, your experiences, even if they don't fit into a, a neatly packaged categorical categorical box, um, the wilder the better. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's a strange world out there, but um, that's what this show. That's why the show exists. That's why it's out there. Hundred um, percent. Kind of, yep. So there you go. And it takes two seconds. Just rate this show or this, <laughs> you know, this episode. Um, Exactly. And also, if you're interested in high strangeness or any aspect of it, uh, make sure you go out and grab uh, Justin's book, The Spectrum. It's a fantastic read. Yeah, it's on Amazon and um, no fine bookstores near you. So uh, <laughs> contact a local bookstore and say that you want it. Um, they can get it. And I'll send you your check as well, Mr. Brown. <laughs> Thank you very much for that plug. You're welcome. And there you have it, another exciting episode of The Bunker. Hope you enjoyed it, and hope it gives you some nightmares. (laughs) Good night. Good night, everybody.